A man, after marrying a woman he met online after dating very briefly, died suspiciously after their anniversary dinner. This led to a roller coaster ride of a battle between his family and the wife that lasted for years and years up until just last fall. Today's video is sponsored by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a subscription service or a series of standalone games that you can receive each month. You get sent a box of clues, which you then use to try to solve a murder case. They're pretty challenging, and you can definitely devote a lot of time to figuring them out. You may or may not be surprised to figure out that I've been struggling with mine for a while now. This month's game is called the Mallory Rock Case. When Beth Ferris Hendricks' death is declared after an accident occurred in the small town of Mallory Rock in Maine, her sister Gwen then sets out to investigate the town and prove that Beth was not killed in an accident, she was murdered. Gwen, having grown up on the quiet New England island herself, now has to go and investigate the residents that she's known all of her life. In order to catch the killer, Gwen is going to need your help so she can expose her hometown and, in turn, uncover all the secrets that exist on Mallory Rock. It's really easy to get more immersed into the story-driven aspects of the game. It's full of puzzles and can even come in different difficulties. You get a lot of clues in the box that you use to solve the crime. I got all sorts of stuff with this one, like a coaster, a marker, a set of documents relating to the case, a little guidebook to comb through, and even this big map of the island. This game is the perfect indoor activity for anyone who doesn't feel like going out and blowing a lot of money each weekend like me. It's a fun and interesting way to spend the night, and my friends are usually eager to come by and help me work on it. If you subscribe, you'll get a new game every single month. And even if you don't want to subscribe, you can still buy all the standalone games as well. Part of the proceeds go to the Cold Case Foundation, an organization that helps to solve decades-old cold cases, uh, kind of like the one we'll be going over in today's video. There's even a spoiler-free online community with over 100,000 other users that could help you if you ever get stuck in the game. Use my code, DIRETRIP, all one word, all caps, to get $10 off your purchase, or just click the link down in the description below. The subject of today's story is a man named Barry Pring. Barry was an IT consultant from Devon in the UK, living in London at the time. He had a bachelor's degree in accountancy and a master's degree in IT. He ended up running an IT consultancy in London and, as a result, was a pretty wealthy guy. He owned five properties throughout London and two luxury cars, one of which was a Lotus. And it's thought that he was worth about 1.5 million pounds altogether. His friends said that he was a trusting, fun-loving, yet hard-working guy whose success made many of them feel jealous. He was doing very well in most areas of life, but he was always kind of lacking in the romance department. He never found a woman to marry, and now that he was in his mid-40s, this was really starting to bother him. Barry ended up going to the internet to find a woman, and this was in 2006, before that was near as normal as it is now. He ended up on a website called elenasmodels.com, which described itself as being a Russian and Ukrainian dating site for men who are looking for single women and girls for friendship, relationship, and marriage. He ended up meeting several women who were in Ukraine and made arrangements to fly out to meet four of them. One of these women was Ghana Zuizan? Zuizina? Ghana Zuizina? Who went by Anna, and was 19 years his junior. Anna hadn't been on the site very long, but she was marriage-minded and obviously, being a looker, attracted Barry's attention pretty quickly. She seemed smart and gifted, speaking four languages. She was easygoing, kind, caring, and usually fairly cheerful. She said that all she really wanted was a normal life and a good marriage, and Barry could understand that. Anna told Barry that she was working as an English teacher. However, this was a lie. Barry later found out that she was actually a stripper, working in various gentlemen's clubs. He wasn't very happy with this, but he wasn't angry with her. Rather, he felt pity for her and even gave her a fair chunk of money to give up on that job and leave that career. He went as far as renting an apartment for her, even bought her a car, and sent her an allowance each week. Eventually, they were engaged only a few months later in January of 2007. Their engagement lasted a whopping four days before they were married in a small ceremony out in Ukraine. Pretty quickly, people noted that the marriage was odd, to say the least. They actually barely lived together during their marriage at all, only a few weeks during the first year. 
most of their communication was done over email, uh, not even by phone call, with Barry feeling that she was reluctant to even take his calls at times. They argued over this, with Barry feeling that the marriage was very one-sided on his part. Despite this, he ended up getting an apartment in Kiev under both of their names, along with buying up another property in the immediate area. Barry's best friend, a lawyer named Peter Clifford, was at the couple's wedding. He felt that his friend was completely under his new wife's control, infatuated and obsessed with her. He felt that the whole ceremony felt very unnatural, not genuine at all. After the couple had been married, Peter was invited out to dinner with them one night. It was at this dinner that Anna said something that kind of gave him goosebumps. When speaking of the local police in Kiev, she said, Local police are corrupt, and if one pays them, one can get away with anything. It was absolutely no secret that Barry's parents didn't like Anna either. It's evident that they were unsupported by their son's decision to marry her very early on, as they weren't even invited to the wedding. They claimed the marriage was odd, a complete sham even, saying that they did not act like a regular newlywed couple. They felt that Anna was with him purely for his money and nothing more. One year later, in January of 2008, Barry and Anna were celebrating their one-year anniversary wedding together in Kiev. They went out to a nice restaurant together, blowing quite a bit of money on fancy food and drinks in the process. Barry was elated. At 47, he was finally able to have his nice wife that he had always wanted. He flew out that day just for this dinner. They had a lot of catching up to do, as they had only spent a few short weeks together during the entire year they had been married. After the meal was over, they decided to call a taxi and head home. But they were disappointed to hear that another one wouldn't arrive at the restaurant for about another 40 minutes. Instead, they decided to walk over to the nearest road and try to flag down an oncoming car and hitch a ride. They both climbed over a three-foot-tall barrier in order to get onto the shoulder of the road. It was at this point that Anna realized she left one of her gloves back at the restaurant table. She left Barry there to go grab it. It wasn't long after walking away that she heard two loud thumps behind her. Barry Pring had been struck by a vehicle while on the shoulder of the road. Witnesses said that the car, believed to be a VW Jetta, was speeding rapidly, going about 75 miles per hour when it hit him. He was thrown about 30 meters away. His injuries were fatal, and it didn't take long for him to pass away. There's no evidence that the car braked or even slowed down at all upon hitting him before leaving the scene as quickly as it came. Witnesses felt that the car had hit him deliberately. On the ground at the scene, a false registration plate and a fake taxi light were found, believed to have fallen off of the offending car as it hit him. Back in the UK, Barry's brother got the kind of phone call that nobody ever wants to receive in the middle of the night. It was Anna saying, There has been a terrible accident. Prepare yourself. Barry is dead. She said that she was standing right next to him when the car hit him. The way she told the brother left him very confused, even feeling a bit suspicious. Anna then called Barry's mother as well. During this call, her story slightly changed as she didn't claim to be standing next to him when he was hit, but rather stated that she was walking away when it happened. Anna had Barry's body sent back home rather than be cremated in the local area, as per his family's request. However, she did not attend his funeral. Sometime after the death, Anna traveled back to London. She sold off Barry's Range Rover along with the contents of his apartment. She also took some money out of his bank account. Now, as next of kin, it was completely within her rights to do so. However, this understandably greatly offended Barry's family and obviously did not paint her in a very good light. This case was initially investigated by the Ukraine authorities as a simple hit-and-run accident. However, after a few years, they had the case reclassified as a murder following Barry's family's very vocal opinions. They had been voicing their concerns for years. An extensive investigation was never able to really identify the vehicle or the person driving it, and no one has ever been charged in connection to the death, which was listed as multiple injuries. Although Barry's body was released back to the UK, there was a bitter disagreement between Anna and the family over where the ashes should be placed. That particular argument led to the funeral facing multiple long delays. 
The coroner, Dr. Elizabeth Earland, said that she felt that Barry Pring had been unlawfully killed, although she obviously couldn't say who exactly was responsible. I am satisfied that having heard all the evidence, much of it circumstantial, nevertheless in my view it is overwhelming. I am satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that Barry John Pring has been unlawfully killed, she said. She noted that Barry's guard was down due to being a bit tipsy. She voiced her suspicions about the car having both fake plates and neglecting to either slow down or stop at all after the accident. It was all very suspicious, but it still could have been a fluke and unplanned in any way. But she did feel that Barry could have been tricked into standing in that position that night. Although that was just a theory and it was impossible to know for sure. Both Barry's mother and his father started to suspect that Anna had something to do with Barry's death, and it didn't take long before they were flat out accusing her of organizing for him to be murdered. They mainly based this on their previously existing negative view of her, saying that she was very cold and not at all loving or caring. They ended up hiring a private investigator over in Ukraine, feeling that the authorities did not adequately investigate the murder. Possible murder. They spent over a hundred thousand pounds on this PI only to have him come back with very little new information. But they felt that they were denied justice and they were desperate. Members of the Devon and Cornwall police looked for Anna in London to ask her a few questions, but she was no longer in the area, likely having gone back abroad. It had turned out that the fake plates that fell from the vehicle were stolen from a vehicle parked near where Anna was living at the time, leading to more suspicion against her. Barry's father wanted to tackle the case through a political route, but claimed that the Ukrainian police were a part of the cover-up. He said that the police never investigated the incident properly because they were involved somehow. He accused Anna of having a relationship with a man who could control the traffic police. It is still unclear where this assertion comes from. After years of doubts and suspicions, an entire decade, an inquest was held in January 2017, a legal investigation into the circumstances around a person's death. They would try to establish how, when, and why the death occurred. It's held in a coroner's court and witnesses are called to explain the circumstances. People related to the victim can also raise questions about the death and give their explanations around the surrounding circumstances. Typically, a coroner will come up with a ruling on the case, but sometimes a jury is used. In the end, they will come up with a ruling on what they believe the nature of the death truly was. In the court proceedings, the Pring family accused Anna of murdering Barry for his money, straight up. Anna didn't appear in the inquest, although the court requested she did. She released a statement saying that she had nothing new to add to what she had already told the police countless times over the years. Pring's brother told the inquest that he immediately became suspicious of Anna's involvement after talking to Barry's best friend Peter and hearing some of his stories. He said that he had a gut feeling that something just wasn't right. It didn't sit well with him. When speaking of the call he got informing him of the death, he said, it was very calm, very callous. There was no emotion. It was cold. I was prepared to come to Ukraine right away because my concern was for her. Afterwards, I had a gut feeling that things weren't right. Mr. Clifford said it was possible that my brother may have been murdered for his assets and went through a list of reasons why. The family believed that Barry was drugged before he died, his brother saying, Upon leaving the restaurant, Barry was staggering and barely able to support himself. He hadn't had a lot to drink, and the British coroner's report showed his blood alcohol levels to have been relatively low. In the end, the inquest concluded that Barry Pring was unlawfully killed, but that's as far as their conclusion went. But later down the road, the High Court quashed this ruling. They were unhappy with the way that the inquest was conducted and ordered an entirely new one to take place. This wouldn't actually happen for several more years. So let's move forward. It's now July 2021. I feel like a lot happened last summer. Like we've already covered several things on this channel alone, but uh, anyway. 2021, the new inquest is finally taking place. It's taking place at the Bristol Civil Justice Center under Judge Matthews. In the years leading up to this, Anna had moved to Spain and gotten remarried. She also had her name changed. 
She was now known as Juliana Moore. Her lawyer stated in the inquest that he felt that there had been a gross misrepresentation of his client's position during the previous inquest. He pointed out that, adding insult to injury, the Pring family invoked a forfeiture rule in Anna's inheritance from her husband, saying that she should not receive it because she had murdered him. In order to defend the murder allegation, she was forced to engage with the forfeiture rule which had been raised against her. If she had not, she would have been labeled a murderer. To suggest she's in this for the money, as opposed to defending the murder allegation against her, is a nonsense, the lawyer said. Anna, uh, Juliana, who was now 42 years old, was speaking over a video call from Spain, with travel being, let's say, not as easy over the last couple of years. John McLendon, QC, who was representing Juliana, would ask her, Did you pay anybody to kill Barry? Did you give any consideration, whether sexual or property or anything like that, to reward them for killing Barry? To that, she said, no. The counsel to the inquest proceeded to ask her a few more questions. They asked about two phone calls she had placed around the time Barry was killed, both to men, one being her builder and one being her colleague. She was asked, Did you make any arrangement with either of these two men in relation to the incident that killed your husband? To that too, she said, no. She was further asked if she was motivated by greed to marry Barry and kill him for his money. She gave a bit more of a lengthy statement this time around, saying, For me, my life would be much better with Barry than without him. I don't know why anybody would suggest that I would like to kill him to get some money. I knew about the large mortgages he had. Whatever media was blowing that out there, there were millions or whatever or inheritance, it's not true. I was quite aware of substantial mortgages he had. My life financially would have been much more comfortable having Barry than not having him. She added that, if anything, she would have been much better off if she had just divorced him, if the case had been that she didn't want to be with him. If it were only a divorce, she wouldn't have had to deal with an investigation and she wouldn't have had to share anything with his family. The inquest got ridiculous enough to the point where Anna had to actually deny under oath that she had hypnotized Barry in order to kill him. After the initial assertion that it was hypnotism, the family kind of toned it down a bit and said, okay, well, he was just infatuated to the point where it may as well have been hypnotism, but, uh, still. Barry was a grown-up man. He was very strong-willed. He had his own ideas about life. He wasn't a man that could easily fall under the spell, she said. The judge, Judge Matthews, the senior coroner, eventually came to a conclusion following the full five-day inquest. Apart from the driver of the car, no other person was involved in the death of Barry Pring. In particular, there was no conspiracy to kill him, he stated. He felt that there was not a single piece of direct evidence to show that Juliana was involved with the death, much less that there was some big conspiracy out there to cover up the whole thing. Instead, the allegations against her were based purely on circumstantial evidence and opinions. The judge said that, even if Juliana was cold, or even if Barry was infatuated and manipulated by her, that that wasn't grounds to accuse her of murder. The judge also questioned how wealthy Barry actually was. Sure, he owned several properties, but they were all still mortgaged, and Juliana knew this from the beginning. The Pring family brought up the odd choice of restaurant for their anniversary meal, being that it was next to a fast road, as if that's a reason not to go to a restaurant, but anyway, the judge shut this down as well, saying it was simply a restaurant that served the kind of food they both liked. He also noted that there wasn't any evidence whatsoever that Barry was drugged. Even when it came to the phone calls that Juliana had supposedly made near the death, the judge pointed out that the police were never able to establish if they ever even took place. The family asked why in the hell the couple would try to flag down a car and hitchhike, but the judge pointed out that there was clear evidence of this being a common practice in Kiev at the time. Uh, if any of you watching happen to be from that area, please let us know in the comments if that's true. I'm curious. The family stated that it was very suspicious for Juliana to return to the restaurant, supposedly to pick up a glove. But the judge pointed out that the waitress did indeed find her glove still at the table. Finally, the family ran out of accusations and merely asked why she was so cold and emotionless when reporting the deaths to them. But this could have been for a number of reasons. 
It could have been the language barrier, it could have been cultural differences that led her to report it this way, or she simply could have been trying to stay calm and rational for their sakes. It's hard to tell, but the judge was flabbergasted as to why that would point to murder. He said, if she was so cold and hard, why did she repatriate Barry's body at her own expense as Barry's family wanted, rather than simply having him cremated there? He believed that she was simply trying to keep from upsetting them as much as possible during the phone calls. He added, If this was a murder, it was a curious, risky, and inept way to carry it out. The driver could not have been sure of hitting Barry in a high-speed collision, and if he hit him, that he would kill him. In my view, there are too many ducks to be lined up in a row in order for this to be a sensible means of carrying out a plot to murder. I am not persuaded that there was ever a conspiracy to murder Barry Pring, much less that Juliana Moore was a part of it. After this, the family officially withdrew their allegations of murder against Juliana Moore. They released a statement saying that she indeed had not murdered him. Likely mostly out of fears of being sued now that the court had officially ruled that she had nothing to do with it. To this day, nobody has ever been charged in the hit-and-run killing of Barry Pring. I'm interested to see what you all have to say about this case in the comments. Do you think Juliana had anything to do with it? Do you think it was even planned at all, or if it was just a reckless driver? I haven't really seen much discussion about this case online when I was researching this, so I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like, it helps the video to get seen by other people. And if you like content like this, feel free to subscribe, because I do it a lot. If you want to support the channel even more, I do have a Patreon account, which I always keep in the description below. Speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. We have Rick Torres, Farius, hope I'm pronouncing that right this time, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Jewel G, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Winnicott, Marsh, Buffa Zerk, Lon Rowe, Jewel Movchan, Kim Peak, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Jackie, Tracer Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. You guys are the greatest. And once again, a big shout out to Hunter Killer for sponsoring this episode. Be sure to give him a look. Thank you. Goodbye.